Hello and welcome to How to Create a Self-Sustaining Edible Perennial Garden with Danny Baker at NOFA New Hampshire's 20th Annual Winter Conference. I'm Laura Andrews, NOFA New Hampshire's Program Coordinator, and I'll be hosting this session with Edith Pucci Couchman, Vice President of NOFA New Hampshire's Board of Directors. First, please note that we're recording this session and all sessions throughout the conference, and we will share the recordings with you. Or they, some of them are up now on the website, um, but you'll get a link at the end of the week as a reminder. Uh, everyone will be muted during the workshop, so please type your questions into the chat box throughout the discussion. We'll read out your questions when we get to the Q&A portion of the session. NOFA New Hampshire's Winter Conference is supposed to foster an open, welcoming environment and a safe space for everyone, so please keep your questions and comments constructive in the chat. For technical issues, please feel free to communicate publicly through the chat or message me privately. Um, you can do that here, Laura Andrews or NOFA NH would also go to. If you'd like to access closed captioning, click on the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, click the arrow on the CC icon, and then click show subtitle. And if you're watching in a smaller screen, there might be three dots and more at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And then you can click on that and click the select the show subtitle option. Now, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this conference is taking place on the land of the Penacook tribe or Indakina, the Abenaki word for the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and the waterways and the Alnobak or people who have stewarded this land through the generations. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Danny Baker of Cross Island Farms and creator of the Enchanted Edible Forest. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, let's see there. I just want to give a little introduction of, of where I'm from and what we do on our farm. So I'm from Cross Island Farms, um, which is, this is a picture of the Wellesley Island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River, which is where our farm is actually right there at the base of our windmill. Um, and we're a very diverse certified organic farm. We raise beef cattle, we have meat goats, we raise um, pork, and we also have annual vegetables. Um, we started the farm in 2006. And so during the, for the first, three or four years, we added all these enterprises. And we also um, give tours of the farm. We have a few uh, rustic campsites on our property. We have 102 acres. We host volunteers all seasons. These are a couple uh, tenacious young women who were here in the winter. And we also hold events in the edible forest. So uh, in the seventh year, I started creating the Enchanted Edible Forest where we have you pick tours, workshops, and events, like I mentioned. This is a winter picture of the garden. And uh, I recently wrote a book called The Home Scale Forest Garden, How to Plan, Plant, and Tend a Resilient Edible Landscape. And that's going to be published on, in May, but I believe it's available now through your bookstore. So for uh, tonight's presentation, um, I hope that you will take home tips on how to sustainably, when you, when you create an edible um, perennial planting, whether it's you know, a, a, a hedge separating you from your neighbor or one tree with plants around it in your yard or some, a foundation planting, you, you want to do these things. And so I'm gonna be explaining to you in the next 45 minutes or so, how to do some of these things, lots of specific examples. So you wanna maximize water conservation and solar collection. You wanna build in plant nutrient sources through other plants, so you don't have to add amendments. You wanna manage pests and disease, minimize human labor going forward, and integrate aesthetic appeal. So these are the permaculture principles that um, I've integrated into my garden and I'm gonna share with you. 
So first, if you're gonna do this kind of planting, it's really important to study your land and study it over four seasons because th the sun changes, the shadows, the, the amount of moisture, um, lots of things can change over the four seasons. And if you really wanna understand the property that you're going to be planting in, it's important to take a look and do and create a two scale map. Now this map is not to scale, but it is an example of the kind of sketch that you would do initially and then get some graph paper and do it to scale. So some of the things important to observe are the slopes of the land. For every two degrees of, rather for every degree of, of south slope, you gain two uh, growing days. For every degree of north slope, you lose two growing days. So if you have a tree with fruit that needs to ripen late in the season, you wanna maximize your growing days. And um, so that's why the slopes are important. It's important to observe any flowing water on the surface, any water that just sits on the surface, frost pockets, um, the direction of the wind, any shade and how that changes over the course of the day and over the seasons, um, any uh, structures that exist on the property like uh, a, a telephone pole or a, a utility line overhead, um, any buildings, any, stand, any existing trees, rocks, stumps, all of that should be observed and recorded. So once you have the lay of the land, then you can um, think about what you wanna plant there. So I mentioned that as you plan your planting, conserving water is something really important. Um, with climate change, we get more droughty times and then more very hard rains that can tend to run off. So you wanna conserve water whenever you can. So there's several ways to do that. The more foliage layers you have, the more shade, the cooler the ground stays, the less evaporation, um, and the more um, dew collection. Matching plants with preferred habitats is really important. If you have a plant that needs a lot of water, put it in a wet spot, then you don't have to water it. If you have a, a plant that's drought tolerant, put it where you know it's gonna be drier. Um, you wanna cover your ground everywhere to conserve water, um, create ponds, swales, possibly to capture runoff and Hugo culture mouse. I'm gonna get into each of these in some detail. So this just shows you, this is just one view of my garden, many layers um, capture and conserve water. So the way that works is not only do they shade the ground, but um, on a, on a um, foggy day or at night when, when the air temperature drops below the dew point, a lot of dew collects on leaves. And the more leaves you have, in as many layers as possible on your plot, the more dew is collected. And that dew is absorbed directly by the leaves, but also can accumulate enough to fall to the ground and, and then be absorbed by the ground. So it's many layers serve that function as well as pro providing the shade. So uh, ground cover any, everywhere. So I usually start with wood chips when I start a bed, but then in this right-hand upper picture, you can see I have some strawberries that running strawberries that are gradually going to cover all that ground. On the left, there's a path covered with uh, Dutch white clover, um, creating ponds. Even if it's just a bird bath, it can help um, conserve water and also attract beneficials. And this is an example of a Hugo cultured mound under construction. I'm going to talk a little more about them. So Hugo culture mounds are fantastic at conserving water because they start with a base layer of wood and that wood slowly rots. And as it rots, it absorbs, actually pulls up water from below and stores it. So plants built on the mound, once it's finished, if in a droughty time, can, their roots can, can find the water that's um, absorbed by these logs. And then um, you cover it with all kinds of organic matter. You wanna have brown stuff, leaves, weeds, um, any kind of grass clippings, um, compost, soil, whatever you've got, um, pile it up on top of that. And uh, you wanna have a little bit of green in there because that expedites the decomposition. And um, I usually cover my mounds with uh, wood chips. Just you don't, the top layers you don't, the top two or three inches, you don't want any weed seeds in there. 
So if you cover it with something that doesn't have any weed seeds, you won't have a lot of weeds growing. And this is the lower right-hand corner is just a picture of some mounds I built in the woods. So you can build mounds, you can see water there, there's ice. You can build mounds where you have standing water, like a water table that's above ground and you can create growing area. You can also build them in the woods and create growing areas so you avoid the competition with, with tree roots and they're cheap. You don't, have, you don't need wood, you don't need to cart in soil, you just use what you've got. Um, maximize solar collection. So these are some ways of doing that. Um, planting sun lovers in full sun, shade lovers in shade, tallest trees plants to the north, build in windbreaks to, to break the wind and preserve the heat from the sun, layer your plants to use all the vertical space. The, the, the more vertical space you can, you can occupy with plants, the more sun is going to be collected. So these are just some examples from my garden of planting the tallest trees to the north. So this is a, uh, a black locust um, hedge or windbreak um, that's on the north east side of the garden. And this is um, another northwest side with some black locust on the edge of the garden. And then this is actually a uh, natural windbreak that existed alongside one of uh, part of the garden. This is a planted windbreak. So this is on the north west side and it has hazel bird, it has some uh, uh, tam, uh, tamaracks, it has some uh, pine trees and it very effectively breaks the wind. Uh, and that's that existing windbreak in the winter. <laughs> okay, using all vertical space, um, again, I already mentioned this, uh, the more vertical space, and it might just be um, a shrub layer, which would be about 10 feet tall. If that's all you can fit in your space, that, that uses all the vertical space you have. Um, here, I, I've got the understory, I've got cherry trees, and in back, these are locusts that are even taller. And then of course, shrubs, herbaceous, um, brown cover. Okay, so when you build an edible perennial planting, you wanna make it as self-sustaining as possible. In order to do that, you include different kinds of plants that serve various functions that make it take care of itself. So you don't have to add anything. So one category are nitrogen fixing plants, another are nutri nutrient accumulating plants, um, beneficial insect attracting plants, and what are called aromatic pest confusers. And I'm gonna get into each of these. So here are some examples of nitrogen fixers. This is a, a black locust tree. It grows pretty high. It would be the overstory. It can grow up to like 80 feet. Um, this is a um, red bud, which only grows to about 20 feet, maybe 30. Another nitrogen fixer. I'm gonna talk more about this later in the presentation. This is a Siberian pea shrub which will grow to about maybe 10 by 10, um, has edible flowers and pods and um, fixes nitrogen. This is called gumi. These are the gumi berries, which I got for the first time this year from one of my bushes. And they were quite delicious and it fixes nitrogen. It's a shrub, it can be only six by six. Um, this is autumn olive, which is a slightly larger shrub with edible berries that ripen in mid fall. Um, up here is, is wild blue lupin, another nitrogen fixer, herbaceous plant, um, ground cover, again, the uh, white clover. And then on the lower right, um, there's, a, it's either a hog peanut or, or a, um, oh, I'm forgetting. Anyway, it's, it's a native um, vine that actually has edible tubers underground and fixes nitrogen. Round nut or hog peanut. I always mix them up because they're both native and they're very similar, but it's one or the other. Okay. So including some nitrogen fixers um, of, of whatever height that fits in your planting will provide nitrogen for the surrounding plants. So you won't have to, you won't have to add that kind of fertilizer. Nutrient accumulators are plants that have deep tap roots and pull up 
nutrients from the subsoil that the um, more shallow rooted plants can't access. And when, they, when the leaves fall in the fall or when the herbaceous plant die down and decay, those nutrients become available to the other plants. So this is the far left is Russian comfrey. It's a nutrient accumulator um, par excellence. It accumulates about six different nutrients, including phosphorus and potassium, which are two of the, after nitrogen, two of the most important nutrients for plants. Dandelions accumulate five or six nutrients. So you might choose to leave that in your, in your planting rather than weed it out because it's serving a really important function. Um, this is a tree called uh, purple robe locust and locusts accumulate other nutrients in addition to the nitrogen they produce. And this is very much like a black locust, but it has these gorgeous um, pink to purple flowers instead of the white flowers. Um, lower right is a, um, uh, okay. Um, I need to get rid of the pictures. How do I do that? Close out of the presentation. Maybe? They're blocking my pictures in my view. Yes. Oh, um, hit escape. Oh, will it will it escape everything? It would close out of the. It would just minimize the presentation, make it smaller. No, I don't want to do that. I want to get rid of the pictures of us. Oh, I see. Um, that I am not sure. Okay. Sorry. All right. Whatever. Okay, moving on. Um, beneficial attractor. So <clears throat> this would be flowering plants that attract pollinators as well as beneficial insects. So when you do a planting, if you're thinking about your entire yard or a garden space, you want to have things flowering from as early in the season to as late in the season as possible and as continuously as possible. I don't mean the same plant flowering continuously, but having something flowering. So pollinators that need to have um, pollen or nectar to, for their sustenance will have access to it in your garden and they'll stick around to pollinate the plants that you want to grow for fruit, for example, fruit trees or berry bushes. So this first one is Cornelian cherry. It's an edible cherry bush or, or tree but it has flowers that open before anything else, like in March. So that would be something to consider including. Um, this is, a, I believe, a plum tree. Most of the fruit trees flower in May. Um, crocuses flower very early and saffron crocuses actually flower in um, October. And you might not realize this, but we can grow saffron in zones four or five. I'm growing some in my garden. So you might think about that. Um, this is um, Borage, which uh, is a self-seeding annual, upper right, and it also um, attracts beneficials and it flowers. It's, it's very frost resistant. So it flowers well into the fall, even though it's an annual. Um, elderberry, now down at the bottom are plants. So the top ones represent mostly plants that attract pollinators. The bottom ones um, primarily represent plants that attract beneficial insects like parasitic wasps that will lay their eggs inside the pests that you don't want, and then their babies eat them from the inside out. So any, any plant with a small flower, like an elderberry, Queen Anne's lace, um, this is a fennel flower, and um, goldenrod, some native flowers, all will attract those wasps. So you want to have those kinds of plants interspersed in your garden. So um, Managing pests is that's one way using those kinds of plants. And there are all uh, several other ways, maximizing diversity in all layers, protecting your trunks from rodents, attracting predatory insects, which I just touched on, attracting pest eating animals, including trap crops, including herbs and alliums to confuse pests, or that I think that's misspelled, but anyway, the onion family and excluding deer. So I'm gonna talk about each of these. So maximizing diversity, if this is just an example of a ground cover that has uh, echinacea and lupin and, and blue flax and some strawberries. So the more you mix up your plants at every level, the harder it is for pests to find its object. If you just have you know, a whole bunch of the same plant in one spot, 
then it's kind of easy. The plants can find it, they can multiply, they can have, you know, they don't have to work to find their object. So here are some examples of other pest management um, techniques. So if you do not protect your trunks when it snows, which I know it does in New Hampshire, and if you have rodents, they will, they need to eat in the winter and they will girdle the trunks of your fruit trees and bushes. This is an example. When they girdle it completely around, they'll kill it. If you put some kind of protection around your trunks before it snows, preferably the day you plant them, then you can protect them from these rodents. And I found with bushes, if I take some metal uh, window screening and I cut it to size and I wrap it around the bottom because bushes have so many stems, you can't really put um, this kind of uh, guard around them. Um, you wrap it around and just clip a couple of clothespins on either end to hold it together. That can protect um, the plants. If, if you have a lot of snow, you, you have to kind of make the height of these around the height of your average snowfall. Where I am, it's about a foot. Where you are, it might be three feet. <laughs> so you might need a higher guard. Um, the other thing I do when it does, when it snows heavily, I go out to the garden the next day and I just clean off the top because the rodents are going to burrow under the snow. So as long as the top is exposed to the air, they're not going to get to your trunk. So that's protecting from rodents. Um, trap crops. So I have a few examples here. So a trap crop is just some kind of crop that attracts the pest more than, than the, the plant you want to protect. So this is a um, thimbleberry that grows wild in my area. It, I've just observed it's very attractive to um, Japanese beetles. And when, they, when they're on the thimbleberry, they're not on my raspberries. <laughs> um, I found that Lagusa rose hips, this is a rose hip, are very attractive to chipmunks and they prefer them to some fruits that might be ripening. This is a chipmunk table that might be ripening nearby. Um, and then um, up here in the upper right, I found that if you plant elderberries kind of on the outskirts of your planting, birds are often more attracted to them than they are to um, perhaps grapes that are on the interior. Um, you wanna do what you can to attract the kinds of uh, pest eating uh, wildlife that you have in your area. So this is putting a lot of birdhouses around that attract pest eating birds. Like this is a uh, tree swallow feeding her baby in one of my birdhouses. Uh, ponds, even a small pond or you know, even just a small indentation in the ground will attract frogs, which eat um, slugs and other pests. Um, spiders are great. Um, any kind of uh, dense hedges that give cover for birds that might want to nest there are very helpful. Um, that's pretty much that. And then um, aromatic pest confusers. So the theory is that if you have herbs or onion family plants that exude odors um, that are very uh, noticeable, that if a pest is, if a, some pest of one of your fruit trees is flying in, they might be overwhelmed by the odor of the herb and have difficulty finding their object. So these are just some examples of quite attractive um, and, and yummy things that you can plant to serve this function. This is, these are garlic chives and every part of this plant is edible, the flowers, the stems, even the seeds. These are walking onions or Egyptian onions. It's a perennial onion um, that you only plant once and it takes care of itself. Um, lavender, uh, sweet sicily, um, this, I believe, is um, either mint or oregano. Um, this is Annie's hyssop, and up in the upper right is uh, chamomile. All of these are herbs that um, not only attract pollinators, but also may serve to deter pests. Oops. Okay, deer deterrence. Well, building a really good fence and baiting it, baiting an uh, electrified fence and baiting the electric wire with peanut butter sandwiches. You take aluminum foil, you put some peanut butter in, you wrap it around the wire. Just by the way, turn the electric off first. Um, <laughs> clip it with a clothespin and do that as soon as you erect your fence. And the deer will be curious. They'll smell the peanut butter. They'll come up, touch it with their nose and they'll, they won't wanna go any further. Um, you usually, I baited my fence um, spring and fall, two years running. And by then I think, 
two generations of deer learn. They don't really want to go in there. I, the only, only one time did I have a, a deer problem in this garden, and that's when I left the gate open overnight. Um, this is another technique that I learned that's a lot cheaper and easier to do, a T-post fence with one string of, um, this is a uh, electrified ribbon. It's about an inch wide. It could be yellow or white. The deer can see it at night, and it would be uh, wise to bait this as well, but they'll come up, they'll touch their nose to it, and they won't want to go any further. And I've kept deer out of a, a garden that, <laughs> that was built uh, across a deer run. A deer run is a trail that deer have used for generations. And this particular technique has worked better than anything else I've tried. On a small planting, you can actually use um, uh, fishing line. If you string a bunch of strands of fishing line, it'll deter deer. They'll, they won't see it, they can't see it, they'll touch it, they'll feel like a cobweb, to, like that might, like a cobweb might feel to us at night and they, they back up. That worked for me for a year, but this is a whole half acre garden. And after a while, you know, they got kind of soggy and the deer figured out how to get in. But if you have a small plot, I think that would work well for you. And then finally on the right, I fashioned these out of upside down tomato cages. I wrapped them with um, chicken wire and I fastened them to the ground around seedling trees or bushes um, with a, uh, these metal clips, they're like horseshoe shape that you could stick in the ground. And uh, these are pretty tall tomato cages, but they protected my seedlings from deer until the seedlings outgrew the tomato cages. And then I could take them off. By then the leaves were higher than the deer could reach. And that worked when my fence, my original fences failed. So those are some options for deer. Okay. One of the main permaculture principles, my favorite actually, is minimizing human labor going forward. I'm just going to check the time. Oh, good. Okay. So there's several ways to do that. If you have animals, you can have them do some of the work. You can always let gravity help you. Um, you can frost seed cover crops to improve soil. So it's a pretty low and low labor way of um, improving your soil. Letting your garden mulch itself. Um, use trees for trellises instead of building a trellis. Stick, leave a tree or, or have a tree grow tall enough to be a trellis for a vine. Um, build in access and edge so you can get everywhere um, and match plants with preferred habitat. So that keeps coming up, doesn't it? Match plants with preferred habitat. Okay, if you have animals, um, goats and cows, if you have, let's say, see this back here, that's what my garden looked like before I created it. So I had a lot of brush and trees. We put the goats and the cows in. They took care of a lot of the leaves. Then we put the pigs in, they tilled up the ground and they ate a lot of the perennial weeds. Um, and chickens also, they can eat uh, weed seeds, they can um, uh, cultivate for you, they can eat bugs. Um, so they can be handy too, to help you prepare your soil. Letting gravity help. Um, this was the first half acre garden when uh, under construction and um, we had a whole lot of compost that was collected by a, a summer colony on the island and they didn't want it. So I had it trucked to my property and dumped at the crest of the hill. So every time I had to move that, I moved it down. If you, have an, if you wanna build a pond and it makes sense to build a pond high, that will help you because then gravity can pull the water. If you're gonna move it by hand, you're walking downhill every time you move water. Frost seed cover crops. So <clears throat> the pigs, this is the garden right after the pigs had left. They pretty much you know, cleaned it up pretty well. You can sheet mulch to have the same effect. And then when you take the sheet mulch off, if you still have compacted ground underneath, you can just, uh, frost seeding is when this time of year, actually, I, we, it was freezing last night. It was warm during the day, but now there's, there's snow in the ground. When the snow's gone and you have those free, freeze thaw cycles, freezing at night, thawing during the day, throw your seed over the ground. The, the freeze thaw cycle will suck it in so it has good contact with the soil. And when the temperature is right for it to germinate, it'll just germinate and grow. In this case, I seeded three kinds of clover, which have a, are great at breaking up the ground. They have deep tap roots. And um, when the clover dies, the tap, when the tap roots die, they leave openings in, I have heavy clay. 
They leave openings for roots to, for fruit tree roots, for example, to move into the ground. So you can use other, other um, kinds of crops. You can use grains. I've used oats um, later in the season. They do a really good job and they form a little bit of mulch for the winter as well. Um, uh, turnips can go really deep and break up your pan. So there are many ways you can improve your soil just with, with cover crop seeds. And providing mulch naturally. So there's many ways to do that. There are things called mulch plants. This is an example of a comfrey that produce a huge amount of organic matter which you can cut and drop where you need it um, to provide mulch. These are two native ground covers that I just decided to let move. I couldn't stop them anyway. So I just let them move into my garden and they provide natural living mulch. So I don't have to do it. This is um, ground ivy. And this, these are just wild strawberries and they're perennial mulches. Here in the lower right is an example. I have a pawpaw tree that's getting big enough now where when the leaves fall, there's a lot of mulch there. And as your garden matures, you're gonna have more and more leaves falling. And just like in a forest, your ground will be mulched by your, your plants and you won't have to do anything after a few years. <laughs> Using trees for trellises. So the middle um, picture shows a locust tree. Lo these black locusts grow extremely fast. Mine grew 15 feet in, in three years from a foot high um, seedling. So here's an example of a locust and I have an akebia vine moving, growing up it. Um, which I planted in the third year. And as the locust grows taller, the akebia, grow, the akebia vine grows taller as well. Here's an example of a tree that I left standing in my garden that was there um, when we created the garden. And I'm growing um, a grape vine up it. And I, I'm gonna train, I'm tra in the process of training it on the lower limbs of that tree. Um, and this on the right is an example of a wisteria vine, which is, another nitrogen fixing plant growing up a, stand, a tree that existed in the garden. Building an access. It's really important when you plan your space, um, if it's of any size, to make sure you build an adequate access. My partner, Dave, insisted that I build um, 10 foot wide roads and thank goodness, you know, leave 10 foot wide areas for maybe a tractor to come in. And once, one time my neighbor um, offered me muck dirt from a pond that he was deepening and he could drive his dump truck right to the place where I needed to use that dirt. If I didn't have a 10 foot wide access road, um, I would have had a cart that in one wheelbarrow at a time, it would have been a huge amount of labor. Um, so this is another example of building an access. This is where there's standing water for a good part of the year. This is an old farmer's trick called the corduroy road. You take um, logs about, I use about four foot in diameter, excuse me, four inch in diameter logs. These are 10 feet um, long because this is for a tractor to come in and you lay them side by side, perpendicular to the direction of traffic. Here, they've been, these are new ones that were added these were there for a couple of years. They ended up sinking down. The, the mulch, the um, round cover grows around them. Since they're in the muck, they don't um, decay very fast because no oxygen is getting to them. These last about 10 years. Um, and you can drive a tractor over that. You can walk over that, even if there's standing water above it. Otherwise, you'd be stuck in the muck. So this is a great technique if you have a wet area that you want to be able to traverse. Um, and building an access and edge. So edge is really important to let the light in. So I build, you know, the wide and the wide pathways also allow for a lot of light to, meet, to, to reach all of the plantings that they run between. So that's an example of that. Okay, matching plants with ideal habitats. So this is the fourth time I've mentioned this and I'm gonna just give you a few examples. Grapes do best in a Southeast exposure because they're very uh, fungal, fungus prone, disease prone, and they need to dry up. They need to dry from the morning dew first thing in the morning. So if, they, if, this, if they're on a Southeast exposure, the morning sun hits them, dries them, and it, it reduces the possibility of fungal disease. Also, they need really good ventilation and good drainage. Um, this, and they full sun. Okay, this is a, a Korean nut pine that needs to be in shade for its first couple of years. So I, in this case, I built shade out of just pallet slabs. I just hammered them in and I provided shade for that plant. Um, 
here's an, an upper right is an example of um, a row of raspberries that are planted on a forest edge. Right beyond that fence is like a scrubby forest. And in nature, they grow on a forest edge. So that seemed like matching it with a good habitat and it's worked out. These are cherry trees at the crest of the small hill. They need really good drainage and they're very happy there. Um, and lower right is just an example of some um, red currants growing in the shade of an apricot tree. They really need some shade. They don't do well with the afternoon sun. So this is matching them to their ideal habitat. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some native food plants for the landscape. So, and I'm showing you the zones because I know you guys are in a cold area. Three, three, two, three, four. Okay, most of these are gonna grow wherever you live and they're quite beautiful and yummy. So I already talked about the red bud fixes nitrogen, but the flowers and the small young pea pods that form from the flowers are edible. Um, it can take some shade. It doesn't like wind, um, needs pretty good drainage that won't grow in saturated soil, but it's beautiful in four seasons because it has a vase shaped um, trunk and branches. And even when it's bare in the winter, it looks lovely. These are the leaves. This is on a shady mound. I planted this from seed, by the way. It, it can tolerate quite a bit of shade. It grows, you know, just kind of branches out in a beautiful form. In when they first form um, in spring, the leaves are red and then they turn green and then in fall, they turn um, this golden color. So, I mean, four seasons of beauty and it, it serves, you can eat it and it, it fixes nitrogen. Okay, this is an American plum, another native. Um, beautiful flowers in spring, nice colors in fall, and really tasty edible fruit, which the chipmunks also like. You got to pick it before they eat them. This is hazelbert. Now I'm cheating a little bit because filbert is native. Hazel, hazel nuts are not, but the filbert is very cold hardy. Hazel nuts are bigger. So they cross the two and you get a really nice edible nut. You get a great hedge or windbreak you get four seasons of interest. So um, when the husks form, they're quite attractive. The leaves turn great colors in the fall. And then these catkins are there all winter long and they start turning yellow in February and March. So you have some color really early in the season. And then you, if you can get them before the chipmunks, you get nuts. Also the, the, um, the branches, can, they're really straight and long, and you can use them for poles in your garden. High bush cranberry, another native, very, very hardy. I think this is hardy to zone two. Beautiful flowers in the spring attract beneficials. Edible berries that need to harden off. You need to, they need to be subjected to several frosts till they soften. And then you have to add sugar. They're like, they're very tart like cranberries, but you can eat them. You can make cranberry sauce, you can make jams, whatever. Um, beautiful colors in the fall. And if you don't pick them, the berries will stay on the bush for a good part of the winter. Usually the returning birds in the spring eat them. So you have really nice color in the winter from this bush. Um, grows in the wet, can grow in partial shade, loves the wet. I planted this in a place where it has a high, the water table is at the surface or above all year and they're thriving. They're gonna be about 10 by 10 in mature size and they don't need any care. None of these, by the way, need any significant pruning. So that's another advantage. Um, and fine, I think this is the last one. Let's see. Nope, one more, good. Aronia. Aronia, another native shrub. Um, pretty flowers, nice colors in the fall. Very um, productive of berries, which are very tannic if you try to eat them raw. And they these, these will... Um, ripen in uh, late August, September. Um, but when you cook them, they lose that tannic quality and they very high in antioxidants, very flavorful. Um, I've made a sauce out of them. I add them to yogurt, smoothies. Plus, um, if you mix them with a berry that has a lot of pectin, like currants or raspberries, they, make, they set up to make a really nice jam. And clove currant. Now I know in, in New Hampshire, you're banned from growing European currants. And I think we should do something about that. 
because in New York, we're allowed to grow them now. And they're a very popular fruit, easy to grow, very productive. Um, but because it's New Hampshire that I'm speaking to, I'm gonna talk about clove currant, which is a native currant. So that doesn't fall under that category. Beautiful aromatic flowers in the spring that smell like cloves and you can smell them from hundreds, like more than hundred feet away. Um, delicious currant like berries, but not quite as pungent as the, um, the European currants in the fall. Rather, in August, the berries ripen. The leaves are intricate and interesting, make, you know, look really pretty in the fall when they turn color. And the bush itself is kind of, I don't have a picture, is, is not unattractive in the winter because it's kind of an intricate bush. Doesn't need much pruning, can take some shade, but can take full sun too. Um, easy care. You know, these. All of these plants I'm showing you, the berry plants, second year you'll have berries. Um, what's not to like? <laughs> All right, let's see where, how we're doing. 741, we're doing really well. Next slide. So I have to give credit. Most of the photos in this uh, slideshow are mine, but um, Steve and Vicki Deal took one, Marianne Gonzalez took one, and um, the person I can't read the name of took one too. So thank you for listening. And um, here's my contact information, which I know is in your program as well, but I wanna show you the recommended references and leave this up for a little while. So these are were my Bibles in creating my garden. And I highly recommend them to you if you're interested in uh, creating um, an edible planting of any size. And then the final one is the book I just wrote, which uh, all of these I believe are available through the book the bookstore that's affiliated with your conference. So that's the end of my presentation and I'm open to questions. Awesome, thank you. Um, looks like Amy just shared in the chat a reason why certain species of currant are banned in New Hampshire. Um, they're because they're a host plant for the white pine blister rust. Yes, I'm um, aware of that, but there are cultivars there are cultivars available now that are not carriers of that um, disease. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it, I, I understand that. Yeah, she said that certain species can be planted um, with a permit. Oh, okay, that's good to know, thank you. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, so we do have a couple of questions so far. Everyone, please feel free to type more questions in the chat. Um, Amy was wondering on the Gumi, how many years from planting to fruit? It took, for me, it took about, um, I'm trying to think. Um, it took nine years for this one for me. But that doesn't mean that would be true for everyone. Plus I plant really small, you know, I buy really small plants. The um, autumn olive, uh, fruited a lot sooner, I'd say the third year. Um, have you noticed any invasive tendencies from your planted black locust? Yeah, oh yeah, it has, It has. you know, it, it suckers. Um, I haven't noticed it's self-seeding, but it suckers. But that doesn't seem to be a problem. I know it's considered an invasive in New York State. Um, but but the, the the loophole is if it you're allowed to plant it if it grows in your area, and my neighbor has a stand of black locust, so I figure I'm in the clear. Um, it does sucker, but I don't see I don't find a big problem, um, you know, clipping those suckers when I see them. I mean, I just think there's so many virtues to the black locust. Um, the flowers are edible; they attract beneficials. Um, the wood is very high in BTUs. It's excellent for firewood and for fence posts. It doesn't rot. Um, it's, it's a nitrogen fixing tree. It grows very fast. Um, you know, I, I, there are so many virtues to it that I, I don't find the suckering that much of a problem. Great, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about the autumn olive? and sure. whether it's in, could be invasive or how it's yeah. invasive? No, that's a good question. Um, it's supposedly invasive in zone five and higher. 
Um, I'm in zone four, so I figure I'm okay. If you're concerned about it, um, you know, it, things that are invasive are basically, they're gonna spread, they're opportunists. So if there's logging nearby, if there's a lot of development going on and a lot of bare land, they're gonna, they're gonna spread. If there's an established woods, I don't think you have to worry that much. I could be wrong about that. But um, what I would recommend if you're concerned about it and you wanna grow it is just to net it when the berries form. And that way you can still harvest, but the birds can't get at it. Because that's how it spreads, the birds spread. It. Great, thank you. Um, do you add material to your Googles after a certain amount of time or do you let their fertility and functionality run out and then make new ones? Okay, I've, my garden is only 10 years old. So I, and most of the, the Hugels I built, I built fairly recently. I have added some material to them because of course with gravity and decay, you know, they're gonna shrink a good, at least a third uh, below the original size. Um, so I have, I, I plan for that when I build them, but I have added some top, topping material to some more to prevent erosion than anything else. Um, I, one of my mounds has sunk quite a bit and I'm not sure what I'm gonna do about that. I think I'm just gonna let it be and build, build another one somewhere else. Would you repeat the question, please? Um, do you add material to the hugels after a certain amount of time, or do you let their fertility and functionality run out and then make new ones? Hmm. Well, I don't think the functionality would actually run out. They would just kind of sink down and whatever plants around them would continue to grow. That's my experience with the one that sunk. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Jan is wondering how long it usually takes to grow black locusts for fence posts. For what? For, for fence posts? Yes. Well, of course, it would depend on the conditions, you know, the conditions of the land and everything. But um, mine have grown for nine years now. And a couple of them, I'd say, if I wanted to harvest them for fence posts, I could. I mean, just, I mean, depending on how high the post you want, I could probably get two six foot, well, if you're gonna pound them in, you need more than six footers. Um, I could probably get one to two, not huge, not really, not, not 12 foot. I could get one 12 foot or maybe two six foot fence posts out of a couple of them now. Like that one I showed you in the, let me see if I can go back to that slide. That one. Now, if I had trimmed that up, it would have a straighter trunk, but I didn't. You know, now I'm trimming it up to make room for the plants underneath. So I'd say 10 years. You know, you could certainly let them go longer and you'll have more. You know, you'll have a, 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 a taller trunk. And it depends how, how, uh, how much and, you know, how, um, what's the diameter of your fence post you want. You know, if you want, uh, eight, eight inch diameters versus four inch, that's gonna make a big difference. Okay. Does that make sense? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on this. I planted mine at 10 foot um, centers instead of 30 foot centers, planning to harvest some for that purpose, but I haven't harvested any yet. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Any other questions? Or does anyone want to unmute to ask their question? I hope that was this helpful. Was it what you expected? Definitely. Definitely. Um, here we go. I'm just going to Oh, here's another question. Emma is wondering, are there any tips you have for germinating pawpaws? I haven't attempted to germinate them from seed. 
um, I have seen my pawpaws sucker a bit. And I dug a couple of suckers up one fall and transplanted them right away, and that didn't work. So I think if you if you transplant, if you get a sucker and you transplant it into a pot and give it a little time to establish some roots and then plant it where you want it, I think that might work. But I haven't, I don't have any experience. I understand it's easy to um, propagate them from seed, but I've not done it. Excuse me. Okay, and I did just turn off the, uh, the setting to block people from unmuting. So if anyone does want to unmute to ask questions, you can do so. <laughs> yeah, this is Jan. I was typing furiously, hoping I could get my question in. <laughs> Perfect. A huge high bush cranberry. It's much bigger. I think it's probably 15 feet tall. And it's finally producing a little bit of fruit, not a lot. Hmm. Know if that can be trimmed in order to increase the food production like you would for blueberry bushes. Hmm. Um, I don't know. See, my mine are Crandall, which is a cultivar that's been um, created to be about 10 by 10 and to be productive of fruit. Do you know what you have? Nope. That could be the difference. And I don't, I so I. Minor Crandall, that's the, the name of the cultivar. Um, okay. I would recommend yeah. them because they've done very well for me. I do not know the answer to that. No, no, I, I didn't. I, I wasn't because I, I wasn't sure. I saw it was high bush cranberry, but I don't know. It may have been uh, bred for ornamental reasons rather than um, fruit production. Is that is that a possibility? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I do you know anybody that that grows them for commercial uh, fruit production? I, I hear in Alaska, they, they grow quite a, quite a bit of them. Okay, yeah, I'm just kind of curious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I mean, as far as the high bush cranberry goes, um, if you have a, a place you can't grow anything else and you want to grow some fruit for, for production, like you say, I think it'd be a good choice. Because they can take that wet, you know, that saturated soil. They don't mind that at all. Mine's actually dry and sandy. And it's, mm. it's, it's huge, but it's not producing fruit. Mm. So maybe I'll soil test under it and see what's going on. Do you do, Danny? Do you do soil testing, and how often? And I did. I did soil testing initially. Um, in I, I expanded my garden to an additional half acre, and I tested that soil, and um, once, and it looked pretty good. So I didn't bother testing it again. I mean, it had all the nutrients. It had a lot of organic matter. Well, I, I actually think that second part of the garden was used the property we bought had been a dairy farm starting in 1830 that went out of business in the mid 60s or so of last century and i because of that natural hedgerow and woods all around i think it might have been used for the cattle in the winter and if that was the case you know then the soil would be much better than most of the other places in our farm um, so i think that soil was really good and it even had a decent amount of organic matter when I started the garden there. The, the first, the, where I did the first part of the garden, that first half acre, heavy clay, that, that's where I did the frost seeding and everything. That really needed a lot of amendment, but I never, I never actually tested that soil. Okay. Is it fairly consistent throughout? I know you just mentioned that they're a little bit different, but like my land is very different from like 20 feet away <laughs> oh no mine is i mean it's pretty much a heavy clay base all over um on my property but in that half acre whenever i dug a hole the soil was a little different than the last place i dug a hole <laughs> so there was quite a quite a variation in that particular half acre yeah okay. 
But I I think it's a very good idea to test your soil when you start out. So if you know if if it's particularly acidic and you you want it to be more neutral, you can add lime as part of your preparation. Great, thank you. Joan. And you could forget the runaway bride. Yes, thank you. I'm also one of those that hates to type in all those kinds of lengthy questions. Um, um, I'm on a mission to raise awareness about the invasive jumping worms. Have they oh. made it to your area? I've heard that they've been found in my county, but I haven't seen any. Yes. Um, but also I find there's a lot of resistance with the, with the permaculture crowd. They say, you know, they don't want to hear about it because I know you're more, you know, live with it and everything. But I just want people to be aware of them and, and um, to Google it. You know, if they find them in their yard, do a little research. And there's a really good Facebook page called, and it has 3,200 members, um, Invasive Jumping Worms, Observation, Discussion, and Support Group. So I always what, want to kind of get that information out there. What can you do about it if you find them? You're supposed to collect them and then kill them. That's that's the okay. conflict for some people. You put them into vinegar and water oh. um, because th they are they are like, they're indestructible. They are really just so challenging. And that's what mm -hmm. you'll learn if you Google it. Mm -hmm. um, that, okay, thank you. you know, once they're in your yard, they're, they're gonna change your, your, your whole uh, gardens and your, mm -hmm. you know, your forests and everything. So it's, it's something to learn. Thank you. Right. Well, I just wanna say, I don't consider myself to be a permaculturist. I would definitely kill them if I found them. Um, <laughs> I just, I just like some of the principles, and I've applied them in my garden. But I'm not. I, I have no formal training in permaculture. I, just I saw that in your bio, and I thought, uh oh, you know, because I know the permaculturists are pretty strict about. It. They don't mind invasives. They say, you know, it's more of, of a, you know, learn to live with it and, and adapt, mm -hmm. and not kill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's a follow-up question about the jumping worms, um, if you don't mind, uh, how obvious are they? You're asking the woman who just asked the question. Do you right? want me to answer uh, that? Yes. Um, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you will observe them. They will. If you see them in your yard, they are on top of the soil. They are scooting along like a snake. They call them snake worms also. You'll go to pick it up and they're very hard and rubbery and disgusting and they flop around more of the flopping action. And the other thing is a white band, the clitellum that goes all the way around their bodies. So look for that white banding, but that's the Google thing. You'll, you'll come to identify them. And also they're, they're concerned about plant sales, like swaps, you know, cause you're gonna take it from one garden and put it mm -hmm. into somebody else's mm -hmm. garden. Mm -hmm. And landscape mm -hmm. companies are moving them and the, the compost companies are moving them. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's insidious. So it's like, darn, mm -hmm. you know, but some people are really caught off guard by it cause it's changing mm -hmm. your gardens. It's changing mm -hmm. your raised beds. You know, they're, they're climbing into your raised beds and everything. So, but I don't wanna take up your talk. Right. Your talk. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you. Um, so we're getting close to the end. I'll just pause for one more moment and see if any more questions come in the chat or if anyone wants to unmute. And Danny, do you want to say anything before we close? I just, I asked a question before if it was what people expected. Yeah. Seems like it. Okay. Oh, Jan is unmuting. We didn't hear you. The garden is nicer than I expected. It's very pretty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, it's lovely. Thank you for sharing with us. Come visit. Come visit. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a fun trip. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess we'll wrap up. Uh, this concludes our workshop. Danny, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us. And thank, thank you. you everyone for being here. Um, our next session is tomorrow, Thursday, February 10th at noon. And that is an update on food safety rules for small producers and co-ops. Um, and I will pop the links in the chat here in a moment. Uh, in the meantime, check out our virtual exhibitor fair. We have 17 different exhibitors, including our conference bookstore hosted by Main Street Bookends. 
And when you order any books through Main Street Bookends and include NOFA NH in the comments, 20% of proceeds will be donated back to NOFA New Hampshire. Um, please mark your calendars for our upcoming programs. On February 17th at noon, we have a Farm Bill listening session and our Feeding the Family Organic Gardening series is six sessions from February 22nd to May 3rd. That's every other week. Uh, and then finally, our bulk order program, you can save on farming and gardening supplies by ordering through NOFA, New Hampshire. And the order deadline is February 28th with pickup on March 19th and 20th in Andover, New Hampshire, Ware and Rochester. And thank you again for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.